and our final interview of Dr. Wynn with Dr. Valir. Dr. Valir, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and the pendulum seems to swing back and forth between damage control and early total care. Uh, your paper had laid down some important concrete parameters for early appropriate care among polytraumatized patients. Can you please share with us the current protocol that you have at your institution and any changes that's been made since the publication of the paper? Sure. Thank you, Mai. I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this journal club, club session. Um, so, you know, my concern with this all along is as I got into practice, I realized that this is a spectrum, like many things that we do. It's not an all or nothing thing. And that early total care concept, when we recognize the value of expeditious uh, fixation of femoral fractures and major axial injuries that are going to relegate a person to a recumbent position. Um, we also recognize that that can be uh, excessive surgery, particularly in patients that are not adequately resuscitated, hence the need for damage control strategies in certain patients. Yet I was kind of um, troubled as I got into practice that there really weren't very clear um, indicators as to when to approach one strategy or another. A lot of it is based on, on anecdotal experience and institutional memory and experiences. Uh, so there were pockets of activity where there was more damage control going on and other places where there was a lot more early care going on. And then also issues around what does that mean early? Does that mean within 24 hours? And it's very arbitrary just because we, we said it's 24 hours because there's not a lot of, of prospective literature or higher quality literature that's really looked at this. And so that that was a lot of the impetus for our team to start to look at this more closely at our trauma center. As a result of that work, which entailed collecting an awful lot of, of uh, laboratory data over the first uh, four days of, of, of course after an injury, as well as specifics on injuries to other body systems, the type and timing of fixation strategies that were employed and uh, underlying uh, medical issues, if there were any, um, we came up with the early appropriate care parameters and our our goal as a team, which is a, when I say our team, is a multidisciplinary team. We had two anesthesiologists, uh, two uh, general trauma critical care specialists, one neurosurgeon who also did spine, as well as our director of spine trauma, who's actually orthopedic trained, um, myself, um, a biostatistician who also has a PhD in applied math, and two research coordinators who are all working together um, to try to sort through this. And what we, what we found is, is we wanted to have something that would be simple, that could be easily applied to a broad spectrum of patients very quickly, would be easy to remember, and that it, it would um, not need to be modified a lot for outliers, say with a severe head injury or advanced age or all of these things, so that we could keep it pretty basic, um, yet it would improve upon the work that we were already doing as an institution Ultimately, we were hoping that we could come up with something that we could share and that could be applicable to other trauma systems, but we were able to come up with a simple uh, group of laboratory parameters that um, have to be trending in the direction toward normal, which is reflective of metabolic acidosis that remains, which as we know, is an indicator of major hemorrhage related to trauma and can be confounded by other things like alcohol or, or toxins or um, uh, glucose, uh, but for the most part, our, our pretty simple way to determine someone's oxygen carrying capacity and their ability to tolerate major surgery. One of the things that fell out in our model was um, coagulopathy. It, it didn't appear to have as much impact. And I think it's because as that acidosis is being corrected, um, even with just a very broad resuscitation strategy and not something specific like using Rotem or or our tag or a lot of the newer strategies that came about, um, we, those uh, measures of coagulopathy will also correct while the patient is responding to the resuscitation in the great majority of cases. And so in our system, as we get down to what are called the EAC parameters, that was targeted to provide us with a reduction in the number of early complications that we were seeing in our polytraumatized patients with these fractures of interest. And so in our case, 
we were trying to take it uh, from about a 20% complication rate in terms of um, pulmonary complications, which are pneumonias, pulmonary embolism, um, as well as uh, DVTs, um, infections, and things that we would see in that early period, the pulmonary complications being the majority, of course, of those, and to drop it in half, basically, to go from a, a 20% to a 10%. And our mathematical modeling specialists determined that by following these parameters and paying a little bit closer attention to the resuscitation, we could get into a safe realm where we would easily meet that based on our historical precedent, which was on a sample of about 1,500 adult multiple injured patients with at least one of these fractures. And so it, it, in, in looking at those um, incrementally, the values are really a lactate of less than a four or a pH of greater than or equal to 7.25 or a base excess of less than or equal to negative 5.5. Many of you guys that have done trauma for a long time look at that and, and go, wow, that's really, that's pretty extreme. You know, that's the patient's still fairly acidotic and they are, but they're correcting. And um, it took a lot of scrutiny from our group and a lot of debate when we looked at the data that we had from our own experience to say, wow, we have the courage to try this because it seemed like maybe it would be too aggressive, yet it worked. And it did drop our complication rate. Our complication rate was already pretty good and certainly comparable with other major US trauma centers. And I think you know what we found in looking at the experience that had been published from other centers on a, on a worldwide basis for that matter, there's numbers that are thrown around, but they really don't have a lot of supporting research evidence. And it's difficult to do because it's hard to create um, prospective parameters because you have to have a buy-in of the entire team of people to do this and you have to have system approaches. So that was one of our strengths that we had a team that wanted to try this. And even though we said, wow, we're, we're gonna do this, we're gonna try this, it's a little bit more aggressive. We went to all of the department meetings from the different so trauma some specialists and we agreed as a group that we were going to do it um and we did and and those fractures can be fixed at our place every day of the week including the spine fractures which again many hospitals don't have that capacity or even to do pelvis or acetabulum every day and I, I think in the ideal setting all major trauma centers worldwide would be able to handle that and we're not there yet but that i see that as a goal for us in the future and so you know when we look at um, what we were able to do, it dropped the complication rate down quite a bit. It also, because of that, reduced the length of stay in the ICU, reduced the length of stay in the hospital, led to a substantial decrease in cost for the hospital. And so I turn around and use that for our administration to say, we need more OR support. We need access to the OR every day. Maybe we need more than one room because these cases need to get done. These patients can't wait.